to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse number 11. We welcome you today to our study of the powerful prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a great man of God who in a difficult time of, of captivity and persecution proclaimed the message of God in a way that honored God and hopefully helped the people come back closer to him. We're so glad that you joined us for our study of the book of Ezekiel today. If you don't have your Bible handy, we want you to pause for just a moment, get your Bible, locate it, and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study together today. Today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the Church of Christ, the Lord's Church in your area. They would love for you to stop by and visit one of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love the truth, and who more than anything want to help people go to heaven. If you'd like to know more about the Bible, you'd like to study on the plan of salvation or the church or worship, whatever it may be, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your area who would love to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your desire to know God and His will better. Won't you visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From there, you can access all our videos and audios, written transcripts, all our Bible study material available free of charge from our website. And if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our past lessons, we have lessons on every book in the Old Testament, every book in the New Testament, and a wide variety of topical studies as well. If you'd like to have a copy of that, just go to our website, fill out a free media request form, and from that we can either send you a DVD or a CD free of charge, or you can receive a download for that instantaneously. And don't forget about the Gospel of Christ app, available in the respective stores for the phones. You can get those there. It is a great way to keep up with our latest videos, what we're doing, and study the Word of God in the fast-paced world that we live in. The book of Ezekiel, such a, a powerful message to a people who had for a long time been caught up in idolatry and hopefully the events God puts in place are going to bring them closer to Him. Let me, let me give you some keys, I think, that will help us to maybe place ourselves in the right mindset and understand correctly the book of Isaiah. There's a key phrase that occurs 66 times. You'll hear this phrase throughout the book of Isaiah or Ezekiel, and it's what God's trying to get across to His people. 66 times God says, Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Not these idols, not the heathen nations. That's not who's God. Then they'll know. I am the Lord, God says. And so God's reminding his people, who's God? Who's in charge? Who do we need to listen to? Who do we need to be worried about honoring? There's a, another key phrase that's a unique one to the book of Ezekiel, and it occurs 93 times in the book. Ezekiel will often refer to himself as the, the son of man, 93 times, Ezekiel uses that terminology, and Ezekiel wants them to see he's not some spiritual superhero, as it were. He's not some somebody who's higher and loft. He can relate. He, Ezekiel was a relatable prophet in that he got right down on their level, did things that almost unimaginable that a prophet would do, and yet it made him relatable. You know, when I think about Ezekiel, 
referring to himself as the Son of Man. I can't help but think about the true Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15. There's a couple of key words that you'll hear. The word glory will occur 24 times in the book, that God wants them to bring back His glory, be reminded of how glorious He is, to recognize His sovereign state, and thus God brings His glory into full view in the book of Ezekiel. The verse that we began with, I think sets the stage and is kind of at the heart and center of what God's trying to accomplish in the book of Ezekiel. Listen to this beautiful statement. God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his wicked ways and live. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. God, 11, God does not want wicked people to die and go to hell. God is not an, an angry God who is standing around waiting for people to mess up so he can reap out his vengeance on them. No, here's what God wants. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. God wants all men to be saved. Why did God send the prophet Ezekiel to cry out such a powerful message of, of turning to the people of Israel? Because God doesn't want any man to perish, but all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, verse number 9. Now, there's an image and there's a chapter in the book of Ezekiel that is just such an uh, amazing and graphic picture. We would say this is probably the key chapter in the book. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel is brought in visionary sense to this valley. And as he looks out over this valley, there's death and decay and there's all these uh, a massive amount of dry human bones. And God says, Ezekiel, can those bones live? Ezekiel and it says, God, you know they can't live. And God breathes on them. And the bones began to rattle, as it were. They began to form muscle. They began to form sinew. They take on uh, flesh, and they begin to rise up, and they do live. What's the whole point of that? That which is dead and dry and dusty and, and looks dead and lifeless. When God comes into the picture, when His breath, when His Word enters people's hearts who may be dead and separated from Him, they can be made alive. Again, in Jesus Christ. And friend, surely we can see the picture of that. Sin, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. But free gift of God is eternal life. Here's that valley of sinful people who are dead. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Those people can come back to life in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, just a little bit of background about the prophet Ezekiel himself. Like uh, others that we see in the Bible, Ezekiel's name had a special meaning. It represented, Ezekiel means strength of or from God. And Ezekiel was, a, he was a, both kind of like a prophet priest lineage. His lineage was not just that he was a prophet, he was also able to be a priest of God. He began prophesying at the age of 30, and he prophesied for 22 years. Time frame was somewhere around 590 to 570 era. That would be during the time of the Babylonian captivity, leading toward as they're eventually going to be set free. Ezekiel, how did his life come to an end? Probably a lot like Stephen. He was probably stoned by the people of God. History records Jewish history that he may have been stoned like the people of God. And eventually they got tired of the message that he was preaching. Ezekiel was a contemporary, meaning that he worked in the same time frame with both Daniel and Jeremiah. We have mention of that. Ezekiel 14 verse 14 mentions those as well. Um, when you think about Ezekiel, he was a very bold and a very brave proclaimer of God's word. He would have to speak harsh things to the people, but it wasn't just to the everyday person. He, he spoke out boldly against the elders and the leaders of Israel who led them into this spot as well. And of course, Ezekiel faced some pretty difficult personal experiences in his life. 
Ezekiel lied. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel 4, verses 4 through 8, that Ezekiel lied on his left side. Then his right for a massive amount of time, picturesque of how long God's people had been floundering around, as it were. Ezekiel faced the death of his wife. In Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 18, we learn about that. And so he was a man who faced challenges, faced difficulties, things like why he could refer to himself as the son of man. He, could, he was relatable, and yet he proclaimed such a powerful message from God. Now, the people, and Ezekiel as well, were taken captive during the second deportation of Israel by the Babylonians in 597 B.C., just as God had promised. Jeremiah 25, verses 9 through 12, there would be 70 years of harsh captivity and that second wave of carrying God's people off. Israel is in Babylon by the river Chebar, and he's preaching that message, uh, modern Tel Aviv area. He's preaching that message to the people of God. It's five years into Jehoiakim's captivity that we hear about this message as well. Now, there are some powerful things that I want us to learn from the book of Ezekiel. There's, there's some super encouraging lessons and some bold lessons that I want us to see as well. The first lesson we learn from the book of Ezekiel is about the watchman principle. I want you to take your Bible and I want you to look with me in Ezekiel chapter three and hear what God says about Ezekiel as a watchman. Ezekiel 3.16, it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die and you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wicked way, nor from his, turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he'll die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. And God goes on to tell the same thing about the righteous as well. But here's the point. Ezekiel was set up as a watchman. Um, think, you have to think about the time and the geography in which they're living. Cities would be walled. And that wall was their security and their protection. There was one gate. It was guarded, closed at night. You couldn't get in the city unless you came through the gate during the daytime and you had to be let in. And so what they would do is that on the horizon, they could, on top of the wall, they would set up watchtowers. And in those watchtowers would be an individual who it was his responsibility to constantly scan and view the horizon to make sure there's no enemy approaching. And if he does see an enemy, he's to sound the trumpet. He's to sound the horn. He's to warn them of that impending doom. And if people heard that sound, naturally they would listen to that. They would make preparation. They'd be ready for him to come. If they heard that sound, they didn't do anything. Oh, hey, that was on their own. That was on their own head. And so God says to Ezekiel, I've set you up as a watchman to the people. If you tell the people, you warn them to turn from their evil way and they don't do anything, that's on them. But if you see it coming and you don't warn them, they're going to die in their iniquity. They're responsible for their own actions, but their blood I'm going to require at your hand. Friend, when I think about Ezekiel as a watchman, aren't Christians today reminded that it's our privilege to spread the gospel. I am to preach the gospel to the whole world. I am to preach Jesus, warning every man, teaching every man, that I may present every man perfect in Christ. Colossians 1.24, my responsibility is to sow the seed, to spread the word, to tell about the good news of Jesus, a child of God's is. If people hear that and they don't respond properly to it, that's on their heart. But if I know the gospel, I know what a person needs to do to be saved. I know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and, and how to become a Christian. And I see people who need that in their life, and I never do anything. Have I really obeyed God? 
Can I really say my conscience is clean if I don't ever tell people about the message of Jesus? Do you see what a practical lesson the book of Ezekiel, these lessons in Ezekiel make for us? All right, look at another practical lesson. Look at Ezekiel chapter 6. And I want us to see that sin breaks the heart of God. Ezekiel says in Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 9, Then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where they are carried captive. Watch this. God says, Because I was crushed by their adulterous heart, which has departed from me. You know, when I think about sin, there's so many levels in which sin is wrong. But when you think about sin, friend, do you realize this? God is crushed. It breaks God's heart when we sin against Him. Sin not only separates me from God, God's crushed by our sin. When we do things that God doesn't want us to do, we do things that we know are not right, uh, like a child whose parents are trying to help it, trying to teach it, trying to t train it, and that child turns in rebellion and completely goes against his parent and just does whatever he wants regardless of how they feel. How would a parent feel about something? Your heart would be broke if your child did that because you love them and you want the best for them. God's crushed by Israel's adultery here. And friend, he's crushed when any of us decide to turn from him and live in a life of sin. Then let's notice another powerful lesson from the book of Ezekiel. I want you to see the, the progressive nature of sin as it's pictured in the book of Ezekiel. We mentioned to you about the glory of the Lord. I want you to see how God is trying to work with his people. And they begin to get further from God. And as a result, he gets further from them. Notice what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse number 3. Watch what happens with Israel. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And so God, he's trying to help them. They seem to be separating further from him. His glory then rises up kind of above the temple. Look in Ezekiel chapter 10. Watch what happens in verse 4. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub, paused over the threshold of the temple, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And so here we have a, another separation in God's glory. Look then in verse 18. The glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And then finally we see in chapter 10, God's glory completely departs from his people as they make a decision to fall away further and further from him. You see, God doesn't want to be separated from his people. He's trying to help them see you're causing us to be further apart. Your sin is alienating me from you. And they continue in it. God moved further. They continue in that and eventually... The glory of the Lord completely departs from those people. You see, God wants to have a relationship. God wants to, to have all people to be saved. But the more we sin, the further we push God away, the worse our predicament becomes spiritually. And so the practical application is we need to turn from a life of sin and turn to living for God and giving our life to Him in every way. Now, I want you to see what God tries to do with his people in their heart and their heart in Ezekiel chapter 11. Would you look with me in Ezekiel chapter 11 and hear what God says to his people in verse 19. If they'll come back to him, God says, then I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within them, take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes, keep my judgments and do them for they shall be my people and I shall be their God. What's God, what's the first part of changing from a life of sin to a life of righteousness? It starts in the heart. We're not talking about here. We're talking about here. The Bible heart is here. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If I'm going to please God, I've got to change my way of thinking. In the Bible, that terminology is representative of repentance. 
John came preaching a baptism of repentance and he cried out to the people. Jesus preached, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Peter said in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, repent. Change your heart. Get a new heart and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. You see, the message of Ezekiel, just as practical today. What does God want of those who have been steeped in sin? Those who have stabbed God in the back and crushed him, broken his heart. God just simply wants you to change your heart. Take out that old, hard, stony, I'm going to do it my way mentality, and whatever I want, that's what I'll do. No, get rid of that. Take that heart out and have a heart that's soft, fleshly, soft, that's moldable in the hand of God and that will simply follow and do what God wants you to do in every way. Now, friend, I want you to see that this is a personal decision. And because of the personal nature of sin, you've got to make that decision for yourself. Look in Ezekiel chapter 18. Sin is not something that somebody else gives to me or something that somebody else does. Sin is something that I choose personally. Ezekiel 18 verse 4, there was a proverb in the days of Israel. And the Israelites basically said, the fathers have eaten something sour and the children tasted in their mouth. And God said, no, no, no. You are not going to use that proverb anymore. That is not correct. And let me tell you why. Ezekiel 18 verse 4, God says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. Now listen to this. The soul who sins shall die. It's not as though that this is something I got from my family. This is something that I have inherited. I was born a sinner. I'm going to be a... No, that's not the idea. Your dad, just because your dad or mother may have something, got something sour tasting in their mouth doesn't mean you've got that same sour taste in yours. It's not the way it is. God says all souls are mine. The soul who sins... And the soul who does right, they'll live or they'll die based on their own decisions. Now, let's make that just a little clearer. Look in Ezekiel 18. And I want you to hear what God says in verse number 20. The soul who sins shall die. Now listen. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. We don't bear somebody else's guilt. We don't bear the consequences of that. We don't, we don't incur sin because somebody else was a sinner. The soul who sins will surely die. The one who does right, Ezekiel say, will go on and live. I, 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 don't, want to have the, I don't want to have the mentality that I'm defeated before I start because, friend, every one of us, has a clean slate. God made man upright, Ecclesiastes said, and yet they sought out many schemes against him. And so when we think about the nature of sin, it's personal. Sin is something I, I choose. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm not living in sin because that's what my parents did. That's not, not the way it works. It's not, sin is not something that's inherited. Let me show you that from the book of Ezekiel. There's this idea in our world that sin is something that is inherited, that you were born in sin. And, and friend, that's just not true according to the Bible. And let me show you from Scripture. Look in Ezekiel 28. In verse 12, God says, Son of man, I want you to take up this lamentation, this woe against the king of Tyre. And so God's talking to a king in that day. And listen to what he says in verse number 15. To this king... God says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until, adverb of time, until iniquity was found in you. This king of Tyre, how did he come into the world? Perfect, perfect in all his ways until he chose to sin. He did not come into the world a sinner. He did not inherit sin. That, that, that's not the idea. God made man upright. God didn't make us a bunch of, we were not born in this world stained with sin of, of Adam or like Calvinism says, somebody else. You're perfect in all your ways from the day you were created 
until you decided to sin. That's what the Bible says in Ezekiel 28, verse 15. And so God gives warning after warning to his people, every one of them, God encourages that they get their life right and they live with him. And so my friend, here's what we ask of you today. As we think about the message of Ezekiel, remember, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But here's what God wants, that the wicked turn from their wicked ways and live. What's, what's the message of Ezekiel? It's the message of the whole Bible. God wants man who has chosen for himself the path of sin to come to him and be saved. And friend, that's what, that's what we want today as well. We want you to know that you can call his name Jesus, the one who can save you from your sin. You can call him Jesus because he'll save you. He'll save his people from their sins. He's able to save to the uttermost, completely, those who come to God through him. Ezekiel chapter, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 28 following. And so Jesus is truly the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. Friend, we ask you today, where are you at with the sin problem? That personal problem, if you're of the age of accountability, you know what I'm talking about. The personal guilt and the personal problem of sin. Where are you at with that? Have you come to Jesus and let him help you with that? Do you believe he's the savior of the world? John 8 verse 24. Would you turn from a life of sin and turn to him in repentance? Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. Would you confess him as the Savior and Lord of your life? Romans 10, 10, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And friend, to have every sin washed away, to be clean, to be whole, and to be right with God again. Would you be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Here's what Jesus said. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. We're so glad you joined us today for our study. If we can help you in any way, let us know. And won't you join us next time as we study more together. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.